They laughed. They always did when they saw the primitive battered hulk the humans flew, until the guns started firing. In the deep blackness near the Oort Cloud, Chief Petty Officer Russell Clark stood on the bridge of the UES Dauntless. He gripped the rail as the ship cruised through the void. This was Earth's first warp-capable destroyer, a hard-won prize for the fledgling United Earth Navy. As a veteran spacer, Clark had seen his share of action against pirates and renegades on the fringes of human space. But now, as an unidentified contact appeared on the scopes, a chill ran down his spine. Captain, massive unknown vessel detected, the sensor officer called out. Range 500,000 kilometers and closing. Captain Sinclair leaned forward in his chair, eyes narrowing. On screen. The view screen flickered to life, revealing a behemoth of a ship, angular and alien, overflowing with weapons. It dwarfed the Dauntless, stretching an incredible twenty kilometers from bow to stern. My God, someone whispered, is that, are they... Aliens, Sinclair finished grimly. Our first contact, and they don't look friendly. He turned to the comm officer. Hail them. Before the officer could comply, a searing blue beam lashed out from the alien ship, spearing the dauntless amidships. The destroyer lurched as alarms blared and consoles exploded in showers of sparks. In the sudden darkness of the stricken bridge, lit only by emergency lights, Sinclair coughed through the smoke. Damage report. Engines offline, the engineer shouted over the din. Weapons down, we're dead in space. Sinclair locked eyes with Clark, his expression hard. It seems our first contact has no interest in talking. Sound battle stations. We'll show them what humans are made of. As the crew rushed to action stations, the knowledge pulsed through Clark's mind. If they couldn't get the ship back online, couldn't fight off this alien monster, then Earth and all of humanity would be next. As the Dauntless drifted powerless, a sleek alien shuttlecraft emerged from the behemoth ship. It glided through the void, docking with the destroyer's airlock. The inner airlock door hissed open, and a boarding party of tall, slender humanoids with pale blue skin and glowing eyes strode onto the bridge. They moved with an otherworldly grace, their steps fluid and precise. The group was led by a regal figure, his bearing proud and imperious. He wore an elaborate headdress adorned with shimmering crystals that cast dancing lights across his angular features. "'I am Thul, overseer of the Rakari Dominion,' he announced, his voice resonating with authority. His glowing eyes fixed on Captain Sinclair. "'You will take me to your leader.' Sinclair stood firm, meeting Thul's gaze. "'I'm the captain of this vessel. If you want to talk, you talk to me.' Thule's lips curled in a sneer. You? A mere underling. The Rakari do not waste time with subordinates. Bring me your ruler or suffer the consequences. That's not how it works, Sinclair said, his voice steady. There's a chain of command. I speak for Earth here. Thule's eyes narrowed. He gestured sharply to one of his guards, a hulking brute with a scar-mottled face. The guard reached to his hip and drew a strange weapon, a sleek device that seemed grown rather than manufactured, all flowing lines and crystalline angles. He aimed it at Sinclair's chest. In a blur of motion, Chief Clark launched himself at the guard. They crashed to the deck, grappling for control of the weapon. It discharged with a searing hiss, a lance of blinding light that narrowly missed Sinclair and blasted a molten hole in the bulkhead. Clark and the guard rolled across the deck, a tangle of straining limbs and snarls. With a wrenching twist, Clark ripped the weapon free. He rolled to his feet and spun to face the guard, the strange gun humming with power in his hands. The guard lunged for him, but Clark squeezed the trigger. A pulse of scintillating energy struck the Rakari in the chest, hurling him back. He slammed against the bulkhead and slumped to the deck, stunned. The other Rakari guards stepped back warily, hands hovering near their own weapons, Thule's face contorted with rage. "'You dare!' he hissed at Clark. "'You dare lay hands on a warrior of the Dominion. This insult will not stand.' He turned to Sinclair, jabbing a long finger at him. "'Your ship is now forfeit, human. Your crew will be taken into custody as payment for this transgression. 
Be grateful I do not have you all executed on the spot. Thurl snapped his fingers, and the Rakari guards advanced, pulling gleaming restraints from their belts. They closed in on the bridge crew, intent on shackling them. Clark hefted the captured weapon, putting himself between the aliens and his crewmates. His eyes flicked to Sinclair, awaiting orders. The captain's face was grim, the weight of the moment etched in the lines around his eyes. The fate of the ship, the crew, and perhaps all of Earth hung in the balance. As the Rakari guards closed in, energy cuffs humming ominously, Clark's eyes darted across the bridge consoles. A flashing light caught his attention. The point defense batteries were back online. Without hesitation, he barked an order at the ship's computer. Computer, target the alien shuttle and open fire now. The computer chimed in acknowledgement. A heartbeat later, the hull shuddered as the destroyer's railguns roared to life. Hypersonic slugs ripped through the Rakari shuttle, tearing it to shreds. The docking tube ruptured, venting atmosphere in a violent gale. Thule and his guards staggered as explosive decompression rocked the bridge. Some were blown clean off their feet, tumbling in the sudden hurricane of escaping air. Alarm klaxons blared, adding to the cacophony. Evacuate, Captain Sinclair roared over the chaos. All hands abandon ship, get to the escape pods. The bridge crew leapt into action, racing for the exit. Clark stood his ground, the alien weapon thrumming in his grip. He squeezed off shot after shot, energy pulses slamming into the disoriented Rakari. The boarders fell back, scrambling for cover. One by one, the crew made it to the escape pods. Clark covered their retreat, backing step by step towards the exit. Thule rose to one knee, his elegant headdress askew. He snarled, drawing a sleek sidearm from his belt. A sizzling bolt whipped past Clark's head as he dove through the hatch, sealing it behind him. Clark sprinted down the passageway, the last one to the pods. He hurled himself into the final capsule, just as another alien beam sliced through the hull behind him. The pod blasted free of the dauntless, engines flaring. Through the tiny viewport, Clark watched the stricken destroyer recede into the distance. Its railgun still flashed sporadically, spitting defiance to the end, but it was a futile gesture. Inexorably, the Rakari warship drew the Dauntless into its cavernous hangar bay, swallowing it whole. The human escape pods arrowed towards the distant light of Sul, engines straining. They carried precious cargo, the survivors of humanity's first clash with the Rakari Dominion. Earth had to be warned. The aliens were coming, and they didn't come in peace. The escape pods drifted in the void for hours, their occupants waiting anxiously for rescue. Chief Clark floated in zero-G, his mind replaying the intense confrontation with the Rakari over and over. The look of rage on Thule's face as Clark stunned his guard was burned into his memory. Finally, a UEN search and rescue ship arrived, tractoring the escape pods into its hangar bay. Clark and Captain Sinclair were whisked away to a secure debriefing room where Admiral Novak, the stern-faced commander of Earth's Space Defense Forces, awaited them. Novak wasted no time with pleasantries. The situation is grim, gentlemen. That Rakari mothership you encountered, it's taken up orbit around Earth. They're launching fighters and troop transports by the thousands. Our defenses are being overrun. Sinclair leaned forward, his brow furrowed. What's the plan, Admiral? How do we counterattack? Novak shook his head. There is no counterattack. The nations of Earth have agreed to an unconditional surrender. Surrender! Sinclair exclaimed, rising from his seat. We can't just give up. Do we have no choice? Novak said, his voice heavy. The alternative is the death of billions. The Rakari have made their demands clear. In exchange for a ceasefire, they want the human responsible for destroying Thule's shuttle handed over to them immediately. All eyes turned to Clark. He met their gazes steadily, his face an impassive mask. Sinclair banged his head on the table. No, absolutely not. I won't let my man be sacrificed to those alien bastards. Novak fixed Sinclair with a hard stare. This is not up for debate, Captain. The decision has been made at the highest levels. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. 
Clark stood, straightening his uniform. I'll do it, sir. Chief, no, Sinclair protested. We'll find another way. Clark shook his head. If it saves lives, saves Earth, then it's my duty. I knew the risks when I signed up. He turned to Admiral Novak. I'm ready, sir. Novak nodded solemnly. He gestured to a pair of armed marines who entered the room carrying restraints. As they bound Clark's wrists, Sinclair gripped his shoulder. I'll get you back, Russell, I swear it. The Rakari will pay for this. Clark gave him a grim smile as the marines led him away. Give him hell, Skipper. Hurakari shuttle was waiting in the hangar bay, a full security detail standing guard. Clark was roughly shoved aboard, the alien soldiers eyeing him with open hostility. As the hatch sealed shut behind him, Clark took a deep breath. He was alone now at the mercy of Earth's conquerors, but he would face whatever came with his head held high. He was a sailor of the United Earth Navy. He would not break. Clark's boots clanged on the deck as the Rakari guards marched him through the bowels of the alien mothership. The hallways were dimly lit, the air thick with the acrid scent of ozone. Strange, pulsing conduits snaked along the walls, their purpose unknown. The guards ushered him into a vast chamber, a cavernous space that seemed to stretch on forever. Towering columns adorned with glowing glyphs soared into the vaulted ceiling high above. At the far end, on a raised dais, sat Thule upon a throne of gleaming metal, his expression one of smug satisfaction. The guards shoved Clark to his knees before the overseer. Thule leaned forward, his glowing eyes boring into Clark's. Behold the fate of those who defy the Rakari dominion, Thule said, his voice echoing in the vast chamber. Your world has fallen, your people have submitted, and you, the human who dared to raise a hand against us, are now at my mercy. Clark met Thule's gaze unflinchingly. We may be down, but we're not out. Humanity won't stay under your boot forever. Thule laughed, a cold, mirthless sound. Your spirit is admirable, human, if misguided. You fail to grasp the inevitable. The Rakari have been watching your kind for generations, ever since your first primitive signals reached our listening posts. We have seen your potential and your weakness. Oh. The overseer rose from his throne, pacing the dais. In a scant few centuries you have gone from huddling in caves to reaching for the stars. Impressive. For savages. But your chaotic, undisciplined nature threatens the order we have imposed upon the galaxy. You and your ilk require a firm hand to guide you. Thule gestured to the guards. They hauled Clark to his feet, their grip unyielding. You will spend the rest of your days laboring in the engine room of this very ship, Thule decreed, toiling alongside the other chattel we have collected from across the stars. Perhaps, in time, your descendants will learn to embrace their place in the Dominion. As the guards dragged Clark away, Thule called after him. Take heart, human. Your servitude will bring unity and stability to the cosmos. The Rakari way is the only way. Clark was roughly pulled through a maze of corridors, deeper into the heart of the alien vessel. They entered a sweltering chamber filled with thrumming machinery, the air shimmering with heat haze. Dozens of beings from myriad species labored here, their faces haggard and worn, their bodies glistening with sweat. A hulking insectoid overseer scuttled over, its compound eyes glittering. It chittered something in a harsh, clicking tongue, gesturing to an empty station on the line with a barbed appendage. The guards shoved Clark forward, removing his cuffs. Get to work, slave, the one of them snarled, and pray your efforts please the overseer. The alternative is unpleasant. With that they turned and marched away, leaving Clark to his grim new existence. He stared at the pulsing alien machinery, the weight of his predicament crashing down on him. Earth conquered, his freedom lost, his very humanity forfeit. No, he couldn't accept that, wouldn't accept that. One way or another he would find a way to fight back, to resist the Rakari with every fiber of his being. He owed it to his crew, to his world, to himself. Clark squared his shoulders and stepped up to his station, his eyes already searching for any weakness he could exploit, any chink in his captor's armor. They thought they could break him. They were wrong. The human spirit was indomitable, and Russell Clark would prove it to the galaxy. 
On Earth, in a fortified bunker deep beneath the surface, Captain Sinclair strode into a dimly lit war room. Admiral Novak and a cadre of grim-faced UEN officers were gathered around a holographic display table, their faces bathed in ghostly green light. Captain Good, Novak said, waving him over. We haven't much time. The Rakari are solidifying their hold on the planet as we speak. Sinclair frowned. I still can't believe we surrendered. After everything we've fought for... Novak held up a hand. It was a necessary evil. We needed to lull the Rakari into a false sense of security while we put our real plan into motion. He tapped a control on the table. The hologram shifted, resolving into the image of a gargantuan spacecraft, its hull encrusted with strange, spiky protrusions. It dwarfed even the Rakari mothership. Is that... Sinclair breathed, his eyes widening. For the derelict, yes, Novak confirmed. Our ace in the hole. Xenoarchaeologists have been studying it covertly for months now. It's a warship of unimaginable power, far beyond anything we or the Rakari possess. The Admiral leaned over the table, his gaze intense. If we can get it operational, if we can unlock its secrets, we might just have a chance of throwing off the Rakari yoke and safeguarding Earth's freedom. Sinclair nodded slowly, a glimmer of hope kindling in his chest. What do you need me to do, sir? Novak straightened, his expression hardening. Assemble a crew, Captain. The best of the best, you're going to infiltrate that ancient behemoth and bring its guns to bear on our enemy. The future of the human race is in your hands. In the sweltering depths of the Rakari mothership's engine room, Chief Clark toiled alongside the other slaves, shoveling glowing, crystalline fuel into the gaping moors of the fusion furnaces. The heat was oppressive, the air thick with the stench of sweat and despair. As he worked, a hulking reptilian being with scales the colour of tarnished copper sidled up to him. You're the new meat, he rasped in broken English. I am Zorax of the Karathi people, once a proud warrior, now a slave like the rest. Clark nodded, wiping sweat from his brow. Russell, Clark, United Earth Navy, guess we're all in the same boat now. Zorak snorted. The Rakari have been collecting new species for their empire for centuries. They sweep across the stars, crushing any who resist. The weak serve. The strong are destroyed. As they shoveled, Zorak spoke of the countless worlds the Rakari had subjugated. The civilizations ground to dust beneath their heel. But there was a glimmer of hope in his yellow eyes. There are whispers, he hissed under his breath of a resistance brewing in the shadows, slaves stolen from a hundred worlds, united in their desire to break their chains. When the time is right, we will rise up and strike at the heart of the Dominion itself. Clark's eyes widened, a chance to fight back to make a difference. It was a spark of hope in the darkness. On Earth, Captain Sinclair and his team crept through the echoing corridors of the alien warship they had christened the Prometheus. The air was stale, the only sound the hum of their equipment and the clang of their footsteps on the metal deck. Dr. Eliza Novak, the Admiral's brilliant Xenotech expert, ran her hand along the intricately carved walls, her eyes alight with wonder. The technology here, it's beyond anything we've ever seen. Even the Rakari have nothing like this. Sinclair nodded grimly. Let's hope it's enough to turn the tide. As they approached the towering central computer core, a deep thrum filled the air. The team exchanged nervous glances as a shimmering figure materialized before them. A hologram of a tall, powerfully built humanoid clad in armor that seemed grown rather than forged, all flowing lines and organic curves. I am Imperator Valius Talthor, the figure intoned, his voice like distant thunder. Supreme Commander of the Firstborn Armada, once... Eons ago, we ruled this galaxy with strength and honor. The humans stared in awe as Talthor spoke of his people's rise to power and the great war that had led to their downfall, an ancient conflict that had sundered the stars and left their mighty warships drifting and abandoned. 
Talthor's eyes burning with an inner fire fixed on Sinclair. You have courage, human, to set foot upon this vessel, courage and perhaps foolishness, but I see in you a spark of potential, a will to fight, to claim your destiny. The Imperator stepped forward, his holographic form towering over them. I offer you a choice, Captain. Serve me and I will grant you the power to crush the Rakari, to seize your place as the new Masters of the Stars. All I ask is your loyalty and your obedience. Sinclair's mind raced, the implications staggering, the power of the Prometheus at their fingertips, but at what cost? The Imperator's eyes bored into his, awaiting his answer. The fate of Earth, of all humanity, hung in the balance. In the war room deep beneath the Earth's surface, the debate raged on. Admiral Novak paced the length of the holographic display, his brow furrowed. The Firstborn's technology could turn the tide against the Rakari, he argued, gesturing to the shimmering image of the Prometheus. We may never have another chance like this. But at what cost, countered General Graves, a grizzled veteran of the UEN Marines, this Talthor speaks of servitude, of obedience. How is that any different than what the Rakari demand of us? Captain Sinclair stood silent, his mind churning with the weight of the choice before him. The fate of Earth, of all humanity, rested on his shoulders. Suddenly a chime sounded from the communications console. An officer rushed over, his eyes widening as he read the incoming message. Captain Sinclair, sir, we're receiving a transmission from Chief Clark aboard the Rakari mothership. Sinclair raced to the console, his heart pounding. Clark's face flickered onto the screen, his expression grim. Captain, I don't have much time, he said, his voice low and urgent. I've managed to slice into the Rakari comms. They're planning to strip Earth bare. Resources, technology, everything. Then they're going to glass the planet as a warning to any other would-be rebels. The room fell silent, the horror of Clark's words sinking in. You have to stop them, sir, Clark pressed on. Whatever it takes, even if it means... His eyes flicked to the hologram of the Prometheus, then back to Sinclair even if it means making a deal with the devil. The transmission cut out, leaving Sinclair staring at a screen of static. He turned to face the room, his decision made. We do it, he said, his voice steady. We accept Talthor's offer. Admiral Novak nodded solemnly. I'll inform the Imperator. Prepare your team, Captain. The Prometheus must be ready for battle. Aboard the ancient warship, the human crew watched in awe as the dormant systems surged to life. Consoles glowed, the deck thrumming with barely restrained power. On the viewscreen, the looming bulk of the Rakari mothership filled the frame, growing larger by the second. In the sweltering depths of that ship's engine room, Clark wiped sweat from his brow as he shoveled glowing crystals into the hungry maw of the furnace. Zorax sidled up to him, his reptilian eyes glinting in the hellish light. The resistance has received word, he hissed, his voice barely audible over the roar of the engines. Your people are launching an attack. We will rise up in concert, strike from within while they assault from without. Clark nodded grimly. I'll lead a team to the weapons control center. We'll sabotage as much as we can, give the Prometheus a fighting chance. Zorax clasped Clark's shoulder, his claws digging into the human's flesh. Fight well, Russell Clark, for all our sakes. On the mothership's bridge, Thule seethed as reports flooded in. The ancient warship powering up, the human slaves whispering of rebellion, his fists clenched, the material of his gloves creaking. They dare, he snarled, his voice quivering with rage. These upstart primitives dare to defy the might of the Rakari. He turned to his guards, his eyes blazing with malevolent light. Bring me the leaders of this uprising. I will make an example of them, one that will echo across the stars and ready the fleet for battle. We will crush this insolence and grind earth to dust beneath our heel. As the Prometheus and the Rakari fleet closed on each other, the pieces were set for a confrontation that would decide the fate of two civilizations, a desperate gamble by a young race fighting for survival and a tyrannical empire determined to maintain its iron grip on the galaxy. The first shots were only moments away. On the bridge of the Prometheus, 
Captain Sinclair gripped the chairs of the command chair as Talthor's holographic form flickered to life before him. The firstborn Imperator's eyes glowed with an ancient, unsettling light as he spoke. The Solar Lance, Talthor intoned, his voice resonating through the chamber, the pinnacle of our civilization's weaponry. It harnesses the very fury of a star, focusing it into a beam of unrivaled, destructive power. Sinclair leaned forward, his brow furrowed. How do we use it? Talthor's image shimmered, a star map blooming to life around him. A pulsing red dot appeared perilously close to the system's sun. You must take the Prometheus into the sun's corona, the Imperator explained. There the solar lance will drink deep of the star's energy, charging its capacitors to full capacity. Only then can it be fired. Sinclair exchanged a look with his crew, seeing the apprehension in their eyes. Dr. Novak stepped forward, her voice tight with concern. The corona, the temperatures, the radiation, can the ship withstand it? Talthor's gaze fell upon her, his expression unreadable. The Prometheus was built to endure the unendurable, to stride the stars like a colossus. It will hold. Sinclair took a deep breath, his decision made. Helm lay in a course for the sun, we're going in. As the Prometheus surged forward, Sinclair opened a comm channel to the rest of the ship. All hands brace for extreme conditions. This is it, people. The fate of Earth rests on our shoulders. In the heart of the Rakari mothership, the battle raged. Energy beams crackled through the air as Clark, Zorax and their team of rebels fought their way towards the weapons control center. The corridors rang with the clash of weapons and the cries of the fallen. Clark ducked as a searing bolt whipped past his head, the heat of it scorching his cheek. He returned fire with his captured Rakari rifle, the alien weapon bucking in his hands. A Rakari guard toppled, his chest a smoking ruin. Push forward! Zorax roared, his reptilian features contorted in a snarl. We're almost there! They burst into the control room in a hail of shattered glass and sparks, alien consoles exploding under their onslaught, but there, waiting for them, was Thule. The Rakari overseer stood amid the chaos, a crackling energy whip coiled in his fist. His eyes blazed with murderous rage. You dare, he hissed, his voice dripping with venom, you dare defy the might of the Rakari. Clark stepped forward, his weapon leveled at Thule's chest. Your reign ends here, Overseer. Thule's lips peeled back in a sneer. You think you can best me, human? I have broken a thousand worlds, I will break you. The whip lashed out, a sizzling arc of energy. Clark rolled, the whip scorching the deck where he'd stood a heartbeat before. He came up firing, but Thule was already moving, a blur of speed and fury. They clashed in the centre of the room, the whip snapping and coiling, Clark's rifle blazing. Consoles shattered and alarms blared as they dueled, locked in a deadly dance. But Clark could feel his strength waning, his body battered and bruised. Thule seemed inexhaustible, a relentless machine of destruction. The overseer's whip snared Clark's rifle wrenching it from his grasp. Thule loomed over him, his eyes alight with triumph. Now, human, he snarled, raising the whip for a killing blow. Now you die. Clark's hand scrabbled across the deck, searching for a weapon, anything to turn the tide. His fingers closed around a jagged shard of metal, torn from a shattered console. As Thule's whip descended, Clark lunged upward, driving the improvised blade into the Rakari's chest. Thule's eyes went wide a choking gasp escaping his lips. Clark rose, his face grim. With a savage twist, he hurled Thule back, sending him tumbling over the railing of the reactor core. The overseer vanished into the seething blue glow, his scream echoing long after he'd disappeared. Around them, the Rakari crew fell into disarray, their leader fallen. The rebels surged forward, overwhelming them with sheer numbers and purpose. The tide had turned. On the Prometheus... The bridge crew shielded their eyes as the sun filled the viewscreen, a seething ocean of nuclear fire. The ship bucked and shuddered as it plunged into the corona, its shields flaring with blinding brilliance. Temperature spiking, Dr. Novak shouted over the blaring alarms. Radiation levels off the charts. 
Hold steady, Sinclair roared, his fist clenched on the armrests. Charge status? Eighty percent, came the reply. Ninety capacitors nearing critical mass. The ship groaned, its hull creaking under the immense strain. Sinclair gritted his teeth, sweat beading his brow. The fate of Earth, of all humanity, hung in the balance. Charge complete, the weapons officer cried. Solar lance ready to fire. Lock target on the mothership, Sinclair commanded. Fire on my mark. A tense heartbeat passed, then another. Time seemed to stretch into infinity. Fire. A blinding lance of pure energy erupted from the Prometheus, a searing beam of staggering power. It speared across the void, an unstoppable force of cosmic fury. On the viewscreen, the Rakari mothership loomed, crippled and vulnerable. The solar lance struck it dead amidships, the ship's hull crumpling like tin foil. Explosions blossomed along its length, secondary detonations ripping through its innards. The mothership shuddered, mortally wounded. Then, with a final titanic blast, it shattered, torn apart by the unimaginable power of the solar lance. Debris spun away into the void, glittering in the light of the distant sun. On the bridge of the Prometheus, the crew erupted into cheers, their voices roar with triumph and relief. Against all odds they had done it. Earth was safe. Humanity was free. But as Sinclair slumped back in his chair, exhaustion etched into every line of his face, he knew their fight was far from finished. The Rakari would return, seeking vengeance for this defeat. And out there, amid the stars, countless other threats lurked, waiting to be faced. The Prometheus had struck the first blow for freedom, but the war for the galaxy was only just beginning. The solar lance streaked across the void, a searing spear of pure energy. It struck the Rakari mothership head-on, the blinding beam piercing through weakened shields and armoured hull alike. The vessel shuddered under the immense force, its structure buckling and twisting. For a heartbeat, the mothership held together, a testament to its resilient design. Then, with a silent flash that momentarily outshone the distant sun, it ruptured. Explosions blossomed along its length as vital systems overloaded and failed. Debris spun away into the void, glittering fragments of metal and composite. On the bridge of the Prometheus a cheer went up from the human crew. They clapped each other on the back, their faces alight with the flush of victory. Captain Sinclair slumped in his command chair, exhaustion and relief warring on his features. But their celebration was short-lived. The holographic form of Talthor flickered, his image distorting and reforming. When he spoke, his voice was cold and hard, all pretense of benevolence stripped away. Foolish primates, he sneered, his eyes glinting with malevolent light. Did you truly believe the firstborn would lower themselves to ally with such a primitive species? Sinclair leapt to his feet, his expression thunderous. What is the meaning of this, Talthor? The Imperator's lips curled in a cruel smile. You have served your purpose, human. The Rakari, our ancient foes, lie broken by your hand. Now, with the Dominion shattered, the time has come for the firstborn to reclaim our rightful place as rulers of this galaxy. He raised a hand, his fingers curling into a fist. And you, our dutiful pawns, shall take your place as our obedient servants. Around the bridge, consoles flickered and died, control interfaces fading to black. Sinclair and his crew watched in growing horror as the ship's systems were wrenched from their control, overridden by Talthor's unbreakable spirit. In the ruins of the Rakari mothership, Chief Clark clung to a twisted girder, his suit's magnetic boots anchoring him to the wreckage. Around him, the surviving rebels drifted in the Zero-G, tending to their wounded and scavenging what supplies they could. Zorax jetted over to Clark, his reptilian features grim. A transmission from the Prometheus, he hissed, holding out a salvaged comm unit. It does not bode well. Clark took the unit, listening intently to the garbled distress call. His face hardened as he heard Sinclair's voice, strained and urgent, detailing Talthor's betrayal. We have to stop him, Clark said, his eyes hard. 
If the Firstborn take control of that ship, Earth won't stand a chance. Zorax nodded, baring his fangs. Then we take the fight to them. There are still Rakari shuttles intact in the hangar bays. We can use them to board the Prometheus. As the rebels piled into the shuttles, Clark took one last look at the shattered remnants of the mothership. The battle had been won, but at a terrible cost. Now they faced an even greater threat, one that could spell doom for all of humanity. The shuttles rocketed away from the debris field, engines flaring as they raced to intercept the Prometheus. As they approached, Clark's heart sank. The ancient warship had turned its fearsome weaponry towards Earth, its intent all too clear. We have to get aboard now, he barked, suiting up and checking his weapons. If Talthor fires on Earth, it's all over. With a bone-jarring clang, the shuttles slammed into the Prometheus's hull, disgorging Clark, Zorax, and a dozen battle-hardened rebels. They charged through the ship's corridors, their weapons spitting fire as they clashed with the automated defense systems under Talthor's control. Every meter was bought with blood and sweat, but finally they stood before the towering doors of the central computer core. Clark and Zorax exchanged a grim look. Then, as one, they burst through, weapons leveled. Talthor's hologram loomed over them, his face twisted in a sneer. Persistent vermin, he spat. You only delay the inevitable. The firstborn are invincible. We are eternal. Clark stepped forward, his rifle trained on the flickering apparition. Not invincible, he growled. Just another tyrant looking to impose his will on the galaxy. Talthor laughed a harsh grating sound. And who will stop me, human, you? Your pitiful band of primitives. Clark's eyes darted across the chamber, taking in the pulsing conduits and thrumming reactors. A desperate plan took shape in his mind, a last frantic gambit. He turned to Zorax, his voice low and urgent. Get the others out of here. Evacuate while you still can. The reptilian rebel frowned. What about you? I'm going to make sure Talthor doesn't threaten anyone else ever again, Clark said grimly. Now go, that's an order. As Zorax led the rebels back to the shuttles, Clark approached the central control console. His fingers flew over the interface, overriding safety protocols and initiating the ship's self-destruct sequence. Talthor's hologram flickered, his eyes widening in realization. What are you doing, human? Clark smiled, a hard, mirthless expression. Ending this once and for all. The Imperator roared in fury, lashing out with bolts of disruptive energy. Clark dove for cover, the console exploding behind him in a shower of sparks. He rolled to his feet, firing his rifle in a continuous stream, the shots passing harmlessly through Talthor's insubstantial form. They clashed amid the mounting destruction, the human's raw drive pitted against the alien's ancient cunning, conduits ruptured and reactors overloaded, the very fabric of the ship coming apart around them. Clark fought with a savage intensity, pouring all his strength, all his tenacity, into keeping Talthor occupied. Every second bought was a second closer to the self-destruct reaching critical mass. The timer ticked down inexorably. Five, four, three, two. In a blinding flash, the Prometheus erupted, a cataclysmic explosion that rent the mighty warship asunder. The blast consumed Clark and Talthor alike, a searing conflagration that marked the end of their titanic struggle. From the shuttle, Captain Sinclair and the others watched in stunned silence as the ancient vessel was reduced to a cloud of molten debris. The shock of Clark's sacrifice hit them like a physical blow, a wrenching loss that left them reeling. But even in their grief, they knew that his selfless act had saved Earth, had saved the galaxy from a terrible fate. As they turned their battered craft towards home, they carried with them the memory of Russell Clark, a shining beacon of the indomitable human spirit. Earth lay before them, a blue and green jewel in the darkness of space. It was a world forever changed by their encounter with the Rakari and the Firstborn a world that would bear the scars of this conflict for generations to come. But it was a world that endured, a world that would continue to reach for the stars, guided by the sacrifice of heroes like Chief Russell Clark. His name would be remembered 
his deeds celebrated, a testament to the unyielding courage of humanity in the face of the unknown. As the shuttle descended through the atmosphere, Captain Sinclair looked out over the sprawling cities and vast oceans of his homeworld. The battle was over, but the struggle was just beginning. There would be new challenges to face, new threats to overcome. But for now in this moment, there was a chance to heal, to rebuild, to honour the fallen, and as long as the human spirit remained unbroken, as long as there were those willing to stand against the darkness, there would always be hope. In the wake of the Prometheus' fiery demise, a stunned silence fell over the United Earth Navy fleet. The Rakari ships, their once proud lines shattered and smouldering, drifted aimlessly, their crews shell-shocked and leaderless. One by one, the alien vessels signaled their surrender, their weapons powering down and their shields dissipating. On the bridge of the UEN flagship, Captain Sinclair watched the scene unfold with a mix of relief and sorrow. The threat of the Rakari had been quelled, but at a terrible cost. He thought of Chief Clark, of the man's unwavering courage in the face of certain death. A lump formed in his throat as he realized the magnitude of the sacrifice that had been made. Across the fleet, cheers erupted as the news of the Rakari surrender spread. In the hangar bays of the human ships, the freed slaves who had fought alongside their UEN allies wept and embraced, their shackles finally broken. Zorax, his scales still stained with the blood of the enemy, clasped hands with the human marines, a newfound respect and camaraderie forged in the heat of battle. This is only the beginning, the reptilian warrior said, his voice rough with emotion. We have won a great victory, but our peoples have much rebuilding to do. My kin and I will return to our homeworlds to start anew and forge a better future. Sinclair nodded, his eyes still fixed on the console. You'll have Earth's support, Zorax. We'll stand with you just as you stood with us in our darkest hour. As the alien ships began to break away, setting course for their distant stars, Sinclair knew that the bonds forged in battle would not be easily broken. The alliance between humans and the former slaves of the Rakari would endure, a testament to the power of unity in the face of overwhelming odds. But even as the fleet began the long journey back to Earth, Sinclair couldn't shake the sense of unease that gnawed at him. The war had been won, but at what cost? As the blue-green orb of his homeworld grew larger in the viewscreen, he steeled himself for the challenges that lay ahead. The once bustling cities of Earth lay in ruins, their skylines shattered and their streets choked with rubble. The Rakari invasion had been brief but brutal, leaving a trail of destruction and despair in its wake. Emergency shelters overflowed with the wounded and displaced, while UN troops worked around the clock to restore power and distribute supplies. In the halls of the UEN headquarters, Sinclair found himself thrust into the role of rebuilder and leader, his days consumed by endless meetings and difficult decisions. The weight of responsibility hung heavy on his shoulders, the ghosts of the fallen never far from his thoughts. In a somber ceremony, he stood before a sea of grieving faces, a gleaming medal clutched in his hand. With a heavy heart he spoke of Chief Clark's bravery and selflessness, his words echoing through the hushed auditorium. As he pinned the medal to a velvet cushion, a single tear rolled down his cheek, a silent tribute to a friend and hero lost. In the weeks that followed, as the people of Earth began to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives, Sinclair threw himself into the work of rebuilding. He met with leaders from around the world, forging new alliances and pledging Earth's support to the struggling colonies of the former Rakhari slaves. But even as humanity began to heal, a new shadow fell across the stars. In the depths of the Oort cloud, a lone Rakari scout ship, its hull pitted and scarred, drifted through the endless night. Its crew, haggard and desperate, scanned the surrounding space for any sign of their brethren. Suddenly their senses picked up a faint energy signature, a ghostly echo of a long-forgotten past. With mounting excitement, they followed the signal to its source, a hidden outpost of the firstborn, its ancient structures still intact after countless millennia. As the Rakari ship approached, the outpost's automated defences sprang to life. 
a silent alarm triggered by the intruder's presence. Deep within the facility's core, a signal pulsed out across the stars, a clarion call to the remnants of the firstborn fleet scattered throughout the galaxy. On distant worlds and in the depths of uncharted nebulae, ancient ships stirred to life, their crews awakening from millennia of slumber. They emerged from their stasis pods, blinking in the unfamiliar light, their minds filled with the last memories of a universe at war. As the signal reached Earth, Zorax burst into Sinclair's office, his face grave. The firstborn have returned, he said, his voice urgent. The Rakari have stumbled upon one of their outposts, and now their fleets are awakening. We must prepare for the coming storm. Sinclair's eyes widened, a chill running down his spine. He had hoped that the destruction of the Prometheus had marked the end of the firstborn threat, but now it seemed that their ancient foes were far from vanquished. He rose from his desk, his face tight with certainty. We beat them once and we'll beat them again, he said, his voice steady. We'll stand together, humans and Rakari alike, and we'll show them the strength of our unity. As the first firstborn ships appeared on the edge of the solar system, their hulls gleaming in the starlight, Sinclair stood before the assembled leaders of Earth and the Rakari rebels. His voice rang out, a challenge and a promise to the ancient warriors who had once sought to enslave them. You underestimated us once before and paid the price for your arrogance, he said, his eyes blazing with grit. We are the children of Earth, the guardians of our own destiny. We will not bow to anyone, be they Rakari or Firstborn. If you come in peace, we will welcome you as friends, but if you come as conquerors, know that we will fight you to our last breath, just as we have always done. The choice is yours. The transmission beamed out across the stars, a message of defiance and hope in the face of an uncertain future. On the bridge of his ship, Sinclair watched the first-born fleet hanging in the void, their intentions still unknown. He knew that the road ahead would be long and painful, that the price of freedom was eternal vigilance, but as he looked out at the stars, he knew that the sacrifice of heroes like Chief Clark would light the way forward, a beacon of courage and willpower in the face of the darkness. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.